Christ is risen. God raised our Lord Jesus from death to life. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Please stand as you're able.
morning as we gather in person and online for glorious Easter Sunday worship. We extend a joyful welcome to each of you, whether your first time, occasionally, or for many years at First Methodist. Thank you for celebrating Easter with us. Our prayer is that everyone will be filled with joy and hope to share with others. We also hope you will worship with us again and often. We always invite you to read the upcoming events and announcements in the bulletin. Happy Easter to each and every one. Let us now share our call to worship. This is the day angels bring light into our shadows and women believe the good news. This is the day the Lord awakens us with unexpected grace and the sun breaks out in song. This is the day the Lord has made as tests when I triumphs over death, when love pushes aside fear, when hope walks with us in every moment.
Good morning, and happy Easter. Let's pray this morning. <clears throat> Loving and merciful God, as Mary did on that Easter morning so long, long ago, we look out into the world and worry what will become of us and how we will survive in the darkness and depths of hopelessness. We all have things happening in our lives which bring us sorrow, fear, sadness, and desperation. No one except for you knows all the trials we are facing, and they can appear daunting and undoable. But then, as happened to Mary when she looked into that empty tomb, we suddenly realize that there is a new hope for us, all of us. That empty tomb is your promise, God, that in each ending there is a new beginning, a new life, a promise that we will, you will never forget us, a promise that your hope is and always will be living within us and will never die. How could we doubt you, O oh God? How could we ever feel you would be unfaithful to us despite our lack of faith in you? You sent your Son, whose ultimate sacrifice meant they were cleansed of our sins and welcomed into eternal life in your kingdom. You are with us in the midst of every one of the fears and tribulations we face. You are the answer. Help us, O oh God, to live as you desire us to live, with hope and proclaiming this knowledge, this certainty that you are here, working in and through us to show love and compassion to our neighbor and that not even death can stop your word or prevent us from finding new life, joy, and peace through your grace. And now let us all pray these words which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We read this Easter morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw, and saw the linen cloths lying there. He also saw the face, face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other cloths, but was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Mary stood outside near the tomb. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to a woman, Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and said to him in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Then she told them what he said to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Edward was lying on his deathbed, and the family was taking turns spending time with him. As he was talking to his young granddaughter, Emily, Edward suddenly smelled a familiar and wonderful aroma. It was his favorite, apple pie. His wife, Sandy, must have been baking it for him to enjoy this one last time. Edward asked, Emily, dear, would you please go and ask your grandmother for a slice of that apple pie. It smells so delicious. Emily ran off to fulfill her dying grandfather's last wish. But then Emily returned empty-handed. Where's my pie? Edward asked. Grandma said, it's not for now. It's for the funeral. <laughs> we don't like to think about death, so we joke about it. I agree with Woody Allen. I'm not afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. After Jesus died on the cross, imagine a reporter for the Jerusalem Inquirer interviewing Mary Magdalene. Hello, I'm Tom, a reporter from the Jerusalem Inquirer. I understand that you were a disciple of Jesus who's been crucified. Oh, I am a disciple of Jesus. Jesus is alive. He's risen. Yeah, I heard that rumor. What's your name? They call me Mary Magdalene. Um, do you want news? Jesus is alive. I saw him this morning. It's wonderful news. Why Magdalene? Uh, I'm from Magdala, a little fishing village north of Tiberias. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus. He saved me. 
from the evil voices. Evil voices? Evil voices were in my head. I could not stop them. They made me do crazy things. Like what? Well, my parents had arranged my marriage with Levi, the son of a local rabbi. Very nice. I was looking forward to being his wife, but... What happened? Go on. Well, during the ceremony, his father, Rabbi Joseph, was about to pronounce the seven blessings on us. I was looking at Levi, and he was looking at me, and then the voice in my head said, he's going to hurt you, he's going to kill you. Levi's smile turned to an evil smirk, and his face turned dark, and I started shaking and began sobbing. The voice got louder and louder and said over and over, kill him before he kills you. So I grabbed a candlestick and hit Levi in the face. In the middle of your wedding? Blood went all over my dress. Levi went down, but I bent over and kept beating him. I was evil. I was horrible. Did you kill him? No, they stopped me, thank goodness, but the whole town cursed me, beat me with clubs, drove me out of the village. I spent the night in the graveyard among the tombs. I lay down in an empty tomb and fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I was confused and ashamed. I was battered and bruised. So when did you meet Jesus? A few days later, he came down the road next to the cemetery. I knew he was coming because the voices began saying, The Son of God is coming. Get away. The Son of God, run away. So I got up to run away. But suddenly, Jesus was standing In front of me, I was still wearing my bloody, dirty wedding dress. I was battered and bruised and covered with filth. I can't believe the Lord would have anything to do with me. So what did he do? Jesus said, evil spirits, leave her. Then what? That's all. The voices were gone and have never come back. I owe him my life. I'm so glad Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. Yes, well, we'll come back to that. There have been other rumors, one that you and Jesus were lovers. I wish. But Jesus was always a gentleman around us women. He never made any advances. But you wanted to be his lover. I always wanted to be with him. I loved him. I dreamed of being his wife. But I was unworthy even to have such thoughts. Jesus would have made a wonderful husband, but he was not going to settle down. He was always moving on to the next town. Jesus was driven. He was on a mission from God. What mission? He brought the good news that God's kingdom has come. He talked about how much God loves us and that we should love each other. He healed people from leprosy. He made the lame walk again. He gave sight to the blind. He drove evil spirits out of people like me. He had so much power and goodness in him. He's God's son, and now he's alive. If he had all this power and was God's son, how could they crucify him as a criminal? You can't kill God. I don't know. I just know that he set me free and that he is alive. You say he had all this power, all this power over demons. Why didn't he use this power against Pilate? and the mob that turned against him. I told you, I don't know. But he's come back from the dead. I saw him, I touched him, and I talked with him, and he talked with me. You know, they killed him because he claimed to be the Messiah, the king. He came to take over the throne of David. He got all the people excited. They got their hopes up that he would deliver us from the Romans, but he failed. Worse than all the other pretend messiahs. He deceived us. Jesus is a king. He's more than a king. Some king he couldn't even save himself, let alone his people. He saved me. That's all I know. You claim he's alive. Yes, he is alive. But you don't believe me. I just report the facts, Mary. Tom, you've been reporting about Jesus for months. You know he healed hundreds of people. That is a fact. I don't dispute he was a healer and an exorcist more skilled than any I've ever seen. I was lost, and he found me and set me free. When he died, I was devastated. 
I went to the cemetery to anoint his body with perfumed oils, the least I could do for him. But I could not find him. His tomb was empty. Then Jesus found me in the tombs again. He is alive. Thank the Lord, our Father God. He is alive. Thank you, Martha, for reading Mary's part. Let's give her a hand. I sent her that yesterday afternoon. I appreciate her willingness to step up today. Today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene was the first witness to the resurrection. St. Augustine called her the apostle to the apostles. Why would Jesus appear first to Mary Magdalene? Why would she be the first evangelist? Why give her that honor? The ancients would have disqualified her as a witness. First, she was a woman. The testimony of women was not admissible in court in that ancient patriarchal society. Second, people knew that demons had possessed her. We might say she was mentally ill. The stigma of having been demon-possessed was just as devastating in their culture as the stigma against those who have mental illness is today in our culture. So why Mary Magdalene? She'd been broken by mental illness and marginalized as insignificant. Then Jesus healed her, and she became a disciple of Jesus. Perhaps that is why Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene instead of Peter and the 11 apostles. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is good news for everyone, especially for someone like Mary Magdalene. She had been broken, but Jesus healed her. In our scene, she is broken by grief. Some of you have been heartbroken. You know that devastation. Everyone is invited to share in the good news of Easter and grab hold of hope. Certainly, we will continue to grieve when we lose someone. It's natural and normal. But at some point in the grieving process, God gives us the grace to accept our loss. It may take months or even years. We begin to let go of the pain and heartache. Jesus said to Mary, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to my Father. Perhaps Jesus was telling Mary it was time to let go emotionally. Part of the grieving process is letting go. It's scary to let go of someone we love, and it may even feel like we are being disloyal to them. Some of you may be familiar with the late writer Leo Buscaglia. Leo's mother was a great inspiration to him growing up. One difficult time that he wrote about was when he was seven years old. His pet cat, which he called Little Yellow, was hit by a car and killed. He remembered his friend running up to him yelling, Leo, Leo, Little Yellow's been hit by a car. Leo rushed out into the street and found his cat silent and limp. He was devastated. He couldn't speak. Then he did what any seven-year-old boy would do in that situation. He ran to his mother through, right into her arms and she hugged him and he cried. There, there, my little Felice, his mother whispered, trying to comfort him. Stroking his head, she tried to explain that these things happen, and she was sure that the mother cat next door would give them another kitten. But this was little consolation to Leo. Burying his face, he shook convulsively, his tears soaking her calico apron, then she looked into his eyes and said, Felice, what are you holding on to? He swallowed and looked at her. His mother explained that we can't hold on to things like broken toys. We also can't hold on to people who have died like Grandpapa. And he could not hold on to Little Yellow. Little Yellow had gone to a better place. We cannot keep holding on to those that we have lost. 
Many of us have lost loved ones through the years, and that pain can be unbearable. Easter does not minimize the anguish of our loss, but it does say that there is life beyond this loss. They are not gone forever, but only gone from us for the time being. Easter proclaims we can trust God with those we love. We can have hope and let go. David Wolpe is Rabbi Emeritus at Sinai Temple in Los Angeles. In his book, Teaching Our Children About God, he recalls an ancient Jewish parable about twin unborn baby boys lying together in the womb. One believes there is a world beyond the womb where people run and play, where there are mountains and oceans and stars fill the sky. The other unborn twin can barely contain his contempt for such foolish ideas. Suddenly, the believer of the twins is forced through the birth canal, leaving behind the only way of life he has known. The remaining unborn twin is sad, convinced that a great catastrophe has happened to his companion. Outside the womb, however, the parents are rejoicing for what the remaining brother left behind has just witnessed is not death, but birth. This Wolpe reminds us is a classic view of life beyond the grave, a birth into a world that we on earth can only try to imagine. The Easter message is that we have an older brother who has traveled beyond the tomb, down the birth canal of eternity. He has returned to assure us that God is love and that there's a place prepared for us. We can have hope even in the face of death. We can have the assurance of the loving home that awaits us and those we have loved and lost. Since our son died, Easter has come to mean so much more to me. It is because of Easter that I have hope of seeing him again. In the years after we lost our son, I wrote the book, Heartbreak to Hope, Overcoming the Anguish of Grief. God was healing my heart, and I wanted to help others heal from that anguish. In my despair, in one chapter, I wrote, I abandoned my bed and dragged my carcass to the easy chair. At least something should be easy. Grief has robbed me of sleep again. I turn on the mindless chatter of late-night infomercials. The hawker breaks into my fog for an instant. Wait, there's more! Irritating sales ploy to get me to buy something to clutter my garage. They always promise more but deliver less of anything important. I want more. I want our son back. Is the church like the late-night huckster offering Easter hope every Sunday? Wait, don't despair. There's more. Then on Easter, the pastor preaches the empty tomb. Easter lilies surround the brass quartet. Organ music fills the packed sanctuary, all anxious to hear, wait, there's more. Eager to believe Easter hope. Why not? Without it, the screen goes blank. Without it, death reigns forever. Without it, the darkness wins. Without it, why go on? Thank God for Easter, which gives us hope. Even in the face of death, Easter shines light into our darkness and keeps us going when we have no desire to go on. Jesus' resurrection demonstrates death is a birth into a new and better world with the creator of life who raised Jesus from the dead. Easter fills us with the hope of living with the Lord and those we have loved and lost. Thank God for Easter. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
you are a very generous church. Every year on Easter, we give the entire Easter offering to help needy children. 175 homeless or near homeless children. We help them become ready for school through Day for Hope. And then we also give to the Early Care Center for scholarships for needy families. Thank you for your generosity to these important ministries. Receive this blessing. May Easter hope sustain you when you are afraid, comfort you when you grieve, and give you a reason to go on when everything seems pointless. May the resurrection of Jesus Christ fill you today and forever with Easter hope. Amen.